It's ready. Don't be nervous. <laughs> Deadly Tarantula Girl coming to you from inside my office today with a special Skype interview with the one and only Dr. Hack, the creator and designer of the Venom Lock system. I've done a video on this before and this is a follow-up video to ask him some questions from some viewers and from myself. So let's get started. Good afternoon, Dr. Hack. How are you? Good afternoon. I'm well. How are you? Thanks for having me. Very well. Thank you. I'm so excited. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> so starting off, just tell us a little bit about yourself and the development of the Venom Lock system. Sure. So I'm an emergency medicine physician and medical toxicologist for the last 20 years now. I can't believe I'm saying that. And um, I spent uh, 10 years in North Carolina taking care of a couple hundred people who had been snake bit. And um, I thought that maybe we could do better um, in the management of the care of uh, people who get bitten in the wilderness and have a long way to come back uh, to get uh, definitive medical care. I wanted to sort of invent a new way to make uh, give them a better chance of doing better. Awesome. So you came upon this from seeing the victims of the bites, and that's what helped you get the idea to develop the system? Correct. So reviewing the literature on uh, first aid wilderness snake bite uh, care, um, I noticed that almost everything is directed at bites to the hands and the feet, but that's a very small part of the human anatomy. Uh, and when I looked into, you know, what the standard of care for wilderness therapy for a bite to the other parts of your body, a thigh bite or a chest bite or, you know, or, or a proximal arm bite, um, was there any, any direction or any guidance or any device out there that could help these people who are far from definitive care, far from the hospital, uh, make sure that they got there safely? Um, Excellent. And that's, that's what, that was the impetus for starting to develop this. That makes perfect sense. So um, coming to that, tell us a little bit about how it is used. Okay, so the um, uh, venomous snakes, when they bite, they inject, uh, they inject their venom uh, into the subcutaneous tissue, um, which is uh, not very deep um, for the most part, uh, just under the skin most uh, most uh, um, fangs uh, inject inject in that in that space um, the uh, local effects are what they're going to be whether it's uh, you know whether it uh, starts to digest the tissue or swell you or cause a, obviously a tremendous amount of pain um, but it's the systemic effects when the venom travels towards your heart towards your central circulation that I wanted to slow down that was my goal because when you're far from help and you have a proximal bite, um, you really don't have a whole lot of time to, to get there safely. Um, and I wanted to create a device that would impede the absorption and flow of venom. So when I reviewed the literature for wilderness therapy of snake bite treatments, um, almost all of the literature is uniquely discussing bites to the hands and the feet. And there's very little uh, discussion about proximal bites, bites to the, the upper arm or the, or the thighs or the buttocks or the abdomen, chest, back, no literature on that whatsoever. And um, I know that most wilderness therapies talk about, you know, constriction bandages, you know, the ones that actually work. Right. Um, and they work basically by delaying the absorption and the spread proximally, that means towards the heart, of the venom in the subcutaneous tissues by compressing the lymphatics. 
but how do you really, you know, so I started playing with the idea of how do you compress lymphatics in an area that is not an, on an extremity or not a distal extremity, you know, a hands or, hands or feet. And what I came up with was this idea of squishing, essentially squishing the tissue around, uh, around the bite site to impede the flow of lymphatics. And that's just basically extracellular fluid that travels through and its propulsion is just through muscle activity, um, you know, back towards the, the blood supply. So if we could squish the tissue around uh, around the bite, um, you would give somebody uh, some time or, you know, delay the onset of their systemic envenomation you know, symptoms. Right. So that was the, that was the idea. So you, comp- you use this around the bite area and it kind of creates... Right the other way. Yes. Yeah. Kind of creates a, a vacuum because I actually tried it and it actually yeah. created kind of like a vacuum in that area and so it just keeps the venom in that area contained exactly so that's so that's the idea um that was the theory behind it and then i went to the lab and i tried it um in a large animal model both with a lapid venom and with um eastern diamondback uh venom uh, rattlesnake venom and uh and the results were striking you know um the uh, the uh, animals that got uh, eastern diamondback venom injected into their torso um, uh, lost their blood pressure in less than an hour, right? And you can imagine you're out in the field right. and you get you know you get a proximal bite and you're three hours you know into your hike. Three hours is a, is a long time to have no blood pressure. You probably wouldn't do very well. Right, especially um, for someone who were alone. Or, Absolutely. I mean, most people, I mean, how would you even transport an adult, you know, who, who needed to be moved? So or An unconscious adult. Right. Exactly. Incredibly difficult. And then the animals that I injected with the same amount of uh, Eastern Diamondback venom in their torso and I applied the device. They lived, they lived hours and hours and, you know, and, and we're fine. We had to actually uh, stop the experiment. The end point of the experiment for the uh, treatment pigs uh, was uh, that the lab closed. Wow. I mean, probably would have been longer, but, uh, but, you know, the lab closed, so I had to, I had to end the study. Interesting. Um, so tell yeah. us uh, what you know about um, techniques that have been used by people in the past, and why or why not? they didn't work or how this is superior? Well, um, all of the literature that I have seen that have looked at things that um, base their therapy on suction, Mm -hmm. um, don't actually suck venom out or, you know, the cutting, the uh, cutting the person to bleed them is basically disfiguring and doesn't change the you know, change the amount of envenomation at all. There's venom doesn't run out. Right. Um, for the most part, as soon as the bite occurs, uh, the the uh, venom seeps into the tissue. So it's very hard. To, it's very hard to extract. It's it's not something easily done. And um, the studies that have looked at that have supported that these these things probably don't affect uh, affect the bite very much at all. And then the silly ones, right? We ne- we would never apply a tourniquet. This uh, my device is not designed to be a tourniquet. It's de- it's designed specifically to um, place place compression around the bite site, but not um, impede the blood flow to that to that limb or that body area at all. Right. That's not really, that's not the purpose. Um, um, ice ice doesn't really work. It you know, works for the swelling, but it doesn't uh, affect the inflammation. Um, and then the silly ones like apply an electric shock um, do not work. Uh, none, none, none of those techniques work. So um, that, oh, go ahead. Please. No, and as far as I'm aware, um, this device is the only one that was uh, tested uh, in a laboratory before it was, um, you know, it was released to the public. Wonderful. I was going to say that leads me to my next question. Uh, can you tell us what not to do if bitten? So we've already talked about cutting, tourniquets, suction, electrolysis. Uh, I, I know of someone who asked their wife to shoot off their limb. I'm guessing you don't recommend that. <laughs> no, definitely not. So there, um, 
Go ahead. Tell me your thoughts. No, I mean, so, so, I mean, the best treatment for snake bite is don't get bit. Um, you know, you know, snakes are wild animals. They, they will defend themselves if you approach them. Um, they're not, uh, they're, they're generally, they don't, uh, they don't like to be petted. Um, they definitely don't like to be picked up. They don't like to be kissed. Um, if you see them, you know, you can view them from a respectable distance. You can photograph them. Um, you know, you can wonder at them. There are many, you know, many of them are beautiful creatures of the wild. Um, you know, appreciate them from afar um, and don't get bit. That's, I think that's the best therapy. That's an excellent tip. Um, so a viewer named SMK What's Next asked if you could explain uh, the percentage, the percentageness. Asked if you could explain the percentage. Asked if you could explain the effectiveness of this device. So that leads me to also my question of how likely this device is to improve your chances of survival. You know, difficult question, right? So, uh, so you know, has it has it been has it been you know proven to uh, for use uh, you know in humans? Not yet. Um, which is which is great. Uh, I, I think I think that's awesome. Um, does it have literature behind it? Does it have theoretical um, value? You know, absolutely. Uh, does it work in a large animal model in a very real case? Uh, you know, real uh, torso um, proximal case. The answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, you know. The only way to kind of get effective uh, percentages would be to see actually how it works when it's released. Um, you know, you can't kind of do human studies uh, on this. Nobody wants to volunteer their grandma, you know, to get bit by a snake, <laughs> you know. Exactly. Uh, you know, apply the device in one group, don't apply the device in the other grandma group and see how, how you know, the two groups of grandmas do. Um, I, I love my grandma, so I use, always, you know, <laughs> use the grandma example. Um, no, nobody's willing to do that, which is why it's, it, you know, these, uh, these devices... So the, so the, uh, so in the uh, Eastern Diamondback model, uh, the cutoff was uh, was seven hours. Okay. Okay. So in the in the Eastern Di uh, Eastern Diamondback model, the cutoff was seven hours, and and that study we used two animals in each uh, in each arm. So the control, both the control animals died fairly precipitously uh, in less than an hour. Wow! And and um, one of the uh, one of the treatment animals uh, succumbed at three hundred minutes. So that's what is that? Uh, was that five hours? No. Uh, Six hours. Uh, God. <laughs> how, how horrible is this? No, it would be five hours. Yeah, five hours, right? Okay, um, it's terrible. Both teachers, right? So it succumbed <laughs> at five, you know, at five hours, and the other one survived, um, you know, to the end point, which was seven hours. Wow! So that's a that's a tremendous difference between an hour, right, versus five hours versus seven hours. Definitely. Um, and that's and that's for the that's for the viper bite, and for the uh, elapid bite, um, uh, the end point again was the. Uh, was the seven uh, was the seven hours, and right. So uh, all but one of the treatment animals in the elapid uh, in the elapid study lived to the seven hours, and none of the control animals did. Wow, so significantly. Um, significantly difference between the groups. So here's a question: um, How quickly after you are bitten is it recommended to apply the device? As the, the recommendation is as quickly as possible, which okay. is why we want people to carry the device with them into the field um, when they're going afar in areas where snakes could be. Okay, so everybody carries some stuff with them, even if it's just water in their keys. So, you know, to throw this in your pack or uh, I would probably just strap it around my arm or something. I mean, it it's, weighs nothing. So to carry it with you to potentially save your life would be really incredible yeah I, I think it's worth it uh, it's it's light it's made of plastic it's durable you don't have to worry about getting it wet right um, 
you know, we, we try to make it as compact as possible, but still be effective. Interesting. Um, so, and I think I think anybody who hikes, uh, a, you know, a distance from their means of extraction should probably carry it if they're in uh, snake, um, you know, in areas where you might you might run into snakes. Right. All righty. A viewer named Claire Loves Music commented that the Venom Lock seems like a better method than the suction kits that she had purchased before, that her dad works on an oil rig, so she's planning to purchase one for him because he works in areas that are dense with venomous snakes, and of course, they are far from the medical field. So my question is, other than people that are out hiking in nature, who do you think might be able to make good use of this? Obviously, there are uh, venomous reptile keepers that would want one, that's logical hikers that go into areas like this, but this made me think of a whole new population of people. Who else do you think might might uh, be able to use this device? So other people I had in mind that I think might consider taking Venom Lock with them as they're, as they're on their adventures are hikers, are cyclists, are um, campers, climbers, um, and I specifically had in mind uh, military who are far from definitive care or extraction points who are traveling in areas where venomous snakes could uh, you know are, are endemic um, I, I wanted to give them the best possible shot to um, to, to reach uh, definitive care safely uh, if they get bit so that's a huge portion of the American military because most areas of the US do have some venomous snakes there are large populations in my area that live inside cities. However, the hospital may not necessarily have that anti-venom. They may be able to reach medical care quickly. However, if they use the venom lock device, may have less damage by the time they reach, by the time they receive the anti-venom that they need. So really, I would think um, almost anyone who lives in an area that has venomous snakes probably I mean it wouldn't hurt to have this device around no it, it probably wouldn't um, it, it probably wouldn't hurt uh, at, at all um, you know again to delay the onset of systemic symptoms after snake bite is is the is the venom locks goal um, you, I did want to touch on something um, you know the um, the tissue toxic venoms um, from from viper bites or you know or from a variety of snakes um, essentially their venom is pre-digesting the food that they eat um, and when you get bit you will absolutely have uh, you know damage of your soft tissues in the area that you were bit and nothing is going to change that um, with the exception of of anti-venom right so no device or uh, you know is, is going to change that and the venom lock um, doesn't aspire to change the local, you know, soft tissue damage. That's not what it's for. It is absolutely for um, for inhibiting the systemic uh, absorption of the venom, so you have systemic uh, symptoms like hypotension, like paralysis, like respiratory failure. That's what it's designed for. It's it it will not stop uh, soft tissue injury. Okay, I know a lot of people would say, well, you don't want to localize the damage because of necrosis and things like that. However, what you do want to avoid is death, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so death, is, death is pretty important. It's, you know, death is pretty final. Um, you know, you know um, becoming hypotensive uh, and, not, you know, and not being able to extract yourself from, uh, from, a, from a distant site um, because your blood pressure is so low. Um, really impedes um, Im impedes survival. Um, so, you know, and, and that's and that's what it is. You uh, would would you rather have a theoretical increase in the amount of tissue damage, or would you rather reach the hospital alive? Right. And I, I think that's I think that's a that's a choice that that you know anybody in these uh, in these environments should make. You know, um, and knowing also that the arguments. Uh, that um, you know that that you wouldn't want to use it because it causes tissue dam you know because it causes tissue damage is I, I think it's it's not a valid argument. Um, I think any bite with a tissue toxic uh, snake venom is going to cause tissue damage. Right. And 
and that's and that's probably what's going to happen anyway. Exactly. Okay, so um, if victims of envenomation use the venom lock, how do you think this would change what ER doctors saw during bite trauma? Um, hopefully, they see an alive patient. You know, I would I would much rather see an alive patient than somebody who is uh, has their you know um, who is in shock or who is in respiratory arrest right. uh, from their from their atypical bite. You know, again, this you know the venom lock is not for hand hand or feet bites. You know, it's it's for it's for the it's for the other ninety five percent of the human anatomy, right? It's for it's for bites to the rest of the body. Right. So I know that you mentioned when we spoke that you designed the shape of the device for easier suture, this oval shape. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So the idea behind that is if, if it does indeed um, uh, form a boundary uh, or, you know, and hold the, if it's a tissue toxic uh, venom and it, and it holds that uh, in place, um, when you get to definitive care and you get the anti-venom, if that area does indeed necrose, then an ellipse is much easier to, um, you know, to repair than a broad tissue damage like would happen if it was unbounded. You know, if it was a diffuse tissue injury, there, you know, you, you start having to cut stuff out if the if the tissue is necrotic. Right. Um, but if you were if if the device works to uh, to um, form a frame around the bite site, and that and only that area becomes necrotic. And I can't say whether it won't or whether you know whether it will, um, because those studies haven't been done. But theoretically, that that was my idea behind the shape, is that if that area does indeed become necrotic, right, because you hold the venom there, so you can get to the hospital alive, um, and uh, and. And a plastic surgeon needs to repair that area, then then it's in a shape that is amenable to repair, or right. more amenable to repair. That's okay. that's the theory behind it. And it's wide enough, it looks like you can tolerate the bone bite. Oh, yeah. They have such broad things. Um, so this device is actually large enough that it looks like it could even go around a gaboon bite, which is the viper with the longest fang. And so for people who are keeping these animals as a hobby, um, you know, that's something they're going to be looking at. So I think that this is really great. Is there anything else that you would like us to know or like to explain to us about the device or a need for it? Uh, I, I, think, I think the important points are that, you know, essentially uh, Venom Lock is for um, people who are out far from definitive care, who would have a long time to, to get to an extraction point. Um, and it's designed to stop the systemic effects that are possible with an atypical proximal bite. Um, you know, it, it, it finally gives people an option because without this, essentially, there there's no there's no other options. Right. Um, you know, the the other thing is that um, with the on with the delay in onset of systemic symptoms, um, you know, somebody that I you could say somebody who um, works with exotics. Um, you know, if they're milking snakes or whatever, and they get and they get a torso bite, right? And mm -hmm. it's going to be a long time until that anti venom is found, right? Some, uh, you know, a venom that's not um, that's not amenable to crofab, right? Which is what we use in North America. Mm -hmm. um, that you know, where you have to call uh, some zoo or or to get that anti venom flown in. There's going to be a delay. So perhaps we can give somebody enough time uh, to. Uh, you know, so the uh, so the exotic anti venom could be uh, obtained. Right. Um, and that and that's the idea. You know, the the whole thing is the whole thing is designed to potentially save save somebody's life. You know, that was my goal. Excellent. If a patient were to come into you with, say, an eastern diamondback rattlesnake bite, and they had the venom lock on, what would be your sure. course of treatment from there? So I would assess them like any uh, venomous bite, um, and if it was determined that they needed anti-venom, I would absolutely obtain, uh, you know, obtain the, the right, you know, the labs, uh, you know, the laboratory tests that you're supposed to do. I would administer, uh, ad, um, sorry, get IV access, and I would administer anti-venom before I removed uh, the venom lock um, to 
because the you know the concern obviously is or, or the well the benefit of the venom lock is that hopefully it held held the venom in place. So now that I can get the antibodies, you know, the treatment for venomous snake bite on board, then I could release it and let the anti venom get to the venom and start doing its job. Excellent. The storytelling time. <laughs> sure. A gentleman who was snake bit. He he was actually in shock. Okay. Uh, we gave him we gave a uh, place to large bore IVs, gave him fluids, um, and uh, and we got his blood pressure back. At that point, he woke up. And um, we all knew that he'd been snake bit. He'd been brought in by his neighbor. But as soon as he regained consciousness, the first thing that he said was, um, and I'll make up the name here. It's not, it's not the, it's, I've changed the names to protect the innocent. Um, he said, he said, why did Bob shoot me? And we're like, <laughs> like, what do you mean? You know, Bob didn't shoot you. And he said, he said, well, the last thing I remember was, was the sound of gunshots. And actually what the story was, is that this gentleman, my patient, um, had work, been working in his garden. He'd been bitten by a snake, um, and as and as he was working in his garden, he was talking to his neighbor, who was who was a police officer, and uh, and he fell unconscious because he he'd been bitten. Uh, he had a, a fairly proximal bite, uh, but as he was losing consciousness, his neighbor, who was the police officer, took out his gun and shot the snake. <laughs> So, so our victim, as he was losing consciousness, all he heard, uh, all he heard was the gunshot. So when he when he ultimately woke up, you know, he, he thought his neighbor had shot him, uh, which was not the case. Um, you know, so so absolutely, you know, people, uh, and you know, that was one of the first times that I had really seen somebody become profundly hypotensive uh, after a snake bite. Wow. Um, Do you yeah, recall so, what species that was that bit him? It was Tim Rattler. Oh, wow. Absolutely it was. Because um, the neighbor uh, who had shot the snake brought the snake in. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've, I've actually pictures of, uh, of this gunshot, you know, unfortunately, uh, gunshot uh, snake, which, you know. Yeah. You hate, you, hate to see, you hate to see that, of course, but this, this is, you know, unfortunately, you know, this is what happened. Right. Um, yeah, so we positively identified the snake. Interesting. Well, that's yeah. a great story. <laughs> And uh, that does go to show, though, um, if that man were out somewhere by himself, obviously yeah. he would not have been able to care for himself um, yeah. for more I mean, than a moment or two. Respect. Interesting. Yeah. Well, um, I want to thank Dana Savarelli for introducing me to the Venom Lock and for introducing me to you. This has been very enlightening, and I do keep venomous snakes myself, and a lot of people that I know do. And everyone that I live around is around venomous snakes, whether they like it or not. And yeah. so this is something very, very important to be educated on. And so thank you so much for talking with us, for giving up your afternoon to be with me and uh, informing everyone out in the cyber world about it. Absolutely. So thank you so much for having me. It's a real pleasure. And I just, I, I just want people to be safe um, and, have, and have an option where no option uh, had existed in the past. Wonderful. And, uh, and it was a real pleasure. So thanks, thanks for talking uh, with me so nicely. Yes, of it was, course. It was great. So of course you can get the Venom Lock from venomlock.com or from midwesthongs.com, if I've told you guys before. And you can read more about Dr. Hack and how this whole, I don't know what you could call it, device? Is it a device? How yeah, it's this, a device. How this device was invented. And if you want to see more, let me know and maybe I can do another Venom Lock follow-up video. Thank you today to Dana Savarelli and to Dr. Hack and I'll see you guys soon.